Hi, welcome to the Inspiring Leadership Podcast. My name is Richard Thorpe. I'm a performance coach and director of rugby, uh, ex-professional rugby player. And uh, I'm delighted to be here with our host, Jonathan Bowman Perks. Thank you very much indeed, Richard. You have a great voice for radio. I think we need to get you as a commentator <laughs> one day. Definitely think, a move, aside, <laughs> move aside, Brian Moore, in you come. But Richard, look, it is really great to have you on the series. It was Rara Plumtree who said she just was so inspired by the way you showed up, the kind of man you are, the kind of leader you are, that she recommended you for the Inspiring Leadership series. So tell us a bit about, you've, you've had such an interesting life, done so many things. Just give us a bit of a flavor of what you're doing right now and, and in the last couple of years, and then we'll go back to childhood. We'll work our way forward again. Sure, okay. Um, so I'm, uh, I'm Richard Thorpe, <laughs> uh, and I'm, I'm a performance coach. So I work with professional athletes, I work with executives, um, I work with next gen of family offices, um, and essentially help people realize their potential. Uh, how to perform consistently at your best. Uh, I couple this now with my work as a director of rugby, of a national one rugby club called Chinna. Um, we're based over in Oxfordshire. I'm just wearing the, the badge here. So that's the third tier down from the, uh, from the Premiership. And uh, I see them too as, as pretty similar, um, similar endeavours of mine. My job's to get the best out of people. Um, so that's who I am, what I do now. Uh, over the previous sort of four, four years, four, five years now, um, I've been involved in uh, property investment. Uh, I've been involved um, in the family office community. I'm an ambassador for the global, um, global next gen community, which is the, the son of the global family office community. Um, and, um, uh, and alongside my work in property, moved into performance coaching. And um, prior to that, I was a professional rugby player. So I retired from a 13 year professional rugby career in 2016. Um, I had played, I started my rugby journey at uh, London Irish Premiership mm -hmm. Rugby Team. Um, that was in the academy as an 18 year old back in 2003. Um, worked my way through the academy, was, was fortunate to get a senior squad contract out of that. Um, I think there was about five or six that made it out of the 25 that, that started. So I was, I was really pleased with myself. Um, and, and stayed with London Irish for a total of nearly a decade. Um, wow. played, uh, played over 100 games for, uh, for London Irish, played in a premiership final, um, losing against Leicester Tigers uh, by only a couple of points back in, gosh, I think 2007, maybe 2008 now. Um, and then I moved to Leicester Tigers uh, in 2012 and uh, was fortunate enough to win the Premiership with Leicester Tigers. Um, that was a very interesting experience. I had a, a very bad injury mid-season. Sadly, didn't play in that Premiership final. Um, huge impact to me personally, this, this injury, um, which, uh, which should have been a career-ending injury. It was a fractured ulna in my forearm. And, um, but was able to make a recovery and went from the team that won the Premiership to the team that got relegated from it, which was London Welsh. <laughs> so, so joined London Welsh in, I think that was 2013. Uh, so only a year at Leicester. And uh, realised pretty quickly, I'm coming towards the end of my career. Um, as a pro rugby player in England, you're very valuable if you qualify to play for England. There's certain incentives that the RFU give Premiership rugby clubs. Now, I'm English accent, I'm, I'm English, but I've got a Canadian mother. So um, without sacrificing my EQP status, England qualified player status, too early, I did when I joined London uh, Welsh and was fortunate enough to go to the 2015 Rugby World Cup with Canada. Wow. Um, I would probably have to say that that's the pinnacle of my rugby journey. Yeah. Uh, probably Ireland at the Millennium Stadium, Principality Stadium now in Cardiff was just it's just a, an unreal experience uh, and retired at the end of the 2016 season. Wow. So that's me, me as an adult. Yeah, yeah. Well, let's, let's interesting thoughts. I mean, uh, Brian Ashton, the uh, England rugby coach, um, coached you when you were in the uh, under 19s. Uh, he was very interesting on this series. And also there was another CEO who was on the series, David Heron, who was a young uh, Uppingham boy, uh, went to play for Leicester Tigers. 
and uh, had a bit of a shock when he sort of ran at the uh, the bag that one of the the England players was holding. And as he ran towards the bag, with the real committing himself, the guy lifted up and head and kneed him in the head. And he went, "What was that for? Got to learn, lad. You got to learn." And he, and he found with Leicester Tigers, it was quite a grim with the the, the that heap that you had to run up of yeah. earth, and uh, it was quite a baptism of fire. But he's now a CEO of an exec search firm. But no, thank you for that. That's that's a, a, a fascinating story. And take us right back to early childhood with your upbringing with your, your uh, parents or however you were brought up. Who was influential in your life mm. and um, you know shaped you into the leader and the person who's doing performance coaching for other people today? What, who were the influential people, school, parents, whatever? Mm. It's a it's a very easy question for me to answer, but I'll take I might just take a little bit of time to get to it. <laughs> um, so I I grew I grew up I was always that kid that was a foot taller than everybody else. You know, I was like a four, five, six, seven year old, and um, for whatever reason, I just I slouch a bit, and I, I wasn't that confident. I was always very confident at home and and so on, but with my peers, I never I never really was. I, I didn't I never really found my calling as a as a kid. Um, until I picked up a rugby ball at the age of nine and the game just changed. Um, yeah, duck to water is it, probably an easy way to, to explain it, but I just suddenly found this game because I was so much bigger than everybody else. I had so much value. I offered so much and I'd never been involved in anything where as a child, I can remember anyway, where I'd really offered something and been valuable. Mm. So rugby just... It captivated me um, and my dad bless him uh, I've got an older brother who was a very good footballer played for uh, Daryl Daryl Thorpe England students footballer um, so my dad was always trying to get me into football as a kid but I was rubbish so I, take, take, I, I just I, my hand-eye coordination still isn't very good um, I was never even a particularly skillful rugby player, but I was an awful footballer. <laughs> so just never, never wanted to go to football. So dad, bless him, was always like, oh, all I want to do is take you out on Sunday league and, and so on. And then I came home from school as a nine year old and I said to dad, do you know, I think I want to play rugby. And the, I mean, like the, if I reflect back at that moment, I just think, God, if my dad wasn't who he was, I wonder whether I would have made it just someone who is just so unbelievably supportive um challenging as well because i mean that's just as important isn't it um throughout the the following decade and, and continues right to through to this day um what, so what, my, did, what did dad do um it was that unconditional belief in your ability mm. no matter what if I got in the car after a, I'm 11, got in the car after a game, rugby was my life at that stage. Uh, they'd brought down a, a current Harlequins player uh, when we were like 10. And I just looked at him like, oh my God, you can do this for a living? And it was just about was around 95. So it was about the time that we could. I was like, that's what I'm going to do. And I, was, I made up my mind. There and there, as a 10 year old, I decided that I was going to be a pro rugby player when I grew up. And then, that just never really left me. <laughs> uh, and it, yeah, it got tested along the way, but it was still always there. It was just like, and, and I think my dad instilled that in me. Um, un, just unconditional belief. Even if I got in the car at the end of a game and hadn't played particularly well, he'd still just give me that tap on the knee and he would just go, cool, Rich. I, I mean, you weren't on form today, but just wait until they see blah, blah, blah. And, and, when you're a kid, I mean, that, that from your dad as well. I mean, the, and he still, he almost does the same thing now. <laughs> That's great. And, uh, uh, so it, it, it was, yeah, I think to refine it to one thing specific, un unconditional, yeah. possibly. Great. And so in your life thus far, you mentioned about um, that, that very serious break, uh, which had could have been career ending in rugby, but you found a way through. But, but what were your highest, happiest, most proud moment, if there was one? And then what was the darkest moment in your personal life or your, or your professional life? And what did you learn from each of them? And what are we, are we looking as an adult here or as a- Yeah, looking back from now uh, and the whole of your from life. Now, but the whole of your life, right. The whole of your life, whole so of your cap life. Capture teenage years and so on. Um, 
Yeah, I mean, it's it's easy to say the World Cup, um, or even easy to say being a part of the Leicester Tigers team that won a Premiership. But it was it was being part of the London Irish team that lost the Premiership final in 2000, and, I think it's 2008. <laughs> um, sounds, sounds a bit of an odd one, but that was one of those seasons where everything just came together. We didn't have the necessarily the best players in the league. Uh, we, we had some very high quality players, um, but there weren't necessarily, it wasn't like a Leicester Tigers who were half the England squad at that stage. Uh, but what we did, our coach Brian Smith um, subsequently went on and got the England attack job after, uh, after his time with, with us as director of rugby Irish. Um, had this innovative phase play attacking structure that just it just worked it just it broke down defenses we scored tries and we played electric rugby and okay we had a few losses along the way as you do in any in any season and they're always tough but being able to go in day in day out for your full-time job and just see these people that you're that like you feel like you're creating magic with it's that might sound a bit too too going too far with it but it, particularly reflecting back on it now that's that's kind of how i how i view that mm, mm. um we just we had it whatever it might be um mm. probably spend the rest of this podcast yeah, talking no. about what it is but um but uh yeah that would be the that would yeah, okay be the okay and, and so that was the the, the proudest um uh, and the high, the high for you. What about a, a lowest, darkest part of your life or your professional life? The one that, yeah. So the one that that had the greatest impact on me. Um, so I was, uh, I was thirteen years old. I've got an older brother, uh, Daryl, who I mentioned earlier, and um, and an older sister, uh, Michelle, eight, eight and ten years older than me. And as at the age of thirteen, um, I was home alone and. Um, Michelle was looking after me, but she was a um, an air stewardess with Virgin Airways, so and she had to to leave to go to to take a flight over to New York, I think it was. And um, so I spent a couple of hours on my own, and it got to sort of later afternoon, and there was a knock at the door, and it was two police officers, and it's always a bit of a bit of a shock. Um, asked if they could come in. They asked me if I would like a cup of tea in my own house, which is a bit odd one. Um, and they sat me down and they said, um, we believe that your sister's been killed in a car crash. God. Which just hit, hit me like a, like a freight train, obviously. Um, we didn't, I don't think I had a mobile at the time. Well, no, I didn't. Because um, we just, we waited for my mum to come, come home. So I was sort of alone for around sort of 30, 40 minutes with these officers. Um, who we later found out thought that I, because I was always big for my age, uh, I probably looked 18, 19 years old, and I was only 13, because um, it probably was a bit young for, for, for officers to be, to be delivering that sort of news to, to someone. Um, and so mum, mum came home and I'd sort of gone through it, almost like a miniature bereavement, I suppose. Um, I, can kind of, I can remember making up in, uh, deciding in my mind that because I've found out first and I've had this time to process it of course i haven't um it's my job to look after the rest of the family now i can remember thinking that and mum came back and i'm i'm holding her dad comes back i'm looking after the the pair of them my brother comes back and uh and so on um so obviously a, 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 a deeply tragic um event to have happened to our family um and uh and and yeah, I mean, the, the, the following years were, were really tough. I mean, I'd just been accepted to a, to a private school in Croydon called Whitgift um, on a rugby scholarship. And they were, they were unbelievably supportive to help and so on. But what I found is that I, I developed this like predisposition, uh, this natural behavior to sort of put other people's needs before my own. Uh, and throughout the rest of my teens, I was very much what, psychologists might call a people pleaser um i suppose from that from my earlier temperament as a child which was i was kind of like that anyway to the to the huge experience as a early adolescent 
uh, it really sort of cemented that behavior for me. Mm. Um, and that, yeah, I mean, that, that behavior, I, I had to do a bit of work on um, in my early, mid twenties, late twenties even, mm. really understand it. Um, Cause I can speak about this now having fully gone over the whole process and, uh, and, and considering myself to understand what happened, what happened, how I responded, I suppose, yeah. um, quite well. Um, but, hmm. I mean, thank you for sharing that. And I'm just so, so sorry for what you went through. I cannot imagine it. Mm -hmm. um, the only connection I have is standing behind the skirts of my mum when I was three and she got told that my father had been killed flying. And um, it changed our lives forever. And, and I, I saw you even then, just at that moment you were telling me, you were quite choked and understandably because you almost relive it. And I, I just admire you for sharing that. But I, I don't think it's something you can never quite get over. My brother Graham just uh, a couple of months ago was uh, stabbed. Um, the, the, the court case is gonna happen shortly. Um, but a chap tried to murder him and burn his house down with his family in. And it made the national news. And he's a very eminent surgeon, just retired. And at 65, he was minutes away from dying. And, and just even that, when your brother almost dies and, and you wait two or three weeks to know whether he's going to live or not, it is, mm. is a big thing. But to lose your sister, I'm, I'm just so genuinely sorry. And nothing I say will make any better. But thank you for sharing that yeah but i suppose that i'm deeply deeply sorry to hear what's happened to your brother um gosh what a what an event and i, I yeah mm. yeah it just I, I, but i think the thing that you know everything has a lesson to teach us i mean my brother's slowly making recovery it'll take him two years and, and he was a north of england schoolboys rugby player he played against the australians uh, mm -hmm. Brian Ashton remembered the particular uh, match that my brother played number eight in, mm -hmm. uh, but but he is a doctor, a surgeon, kept getting injured more than his patient, more than his patients, uh, and would end up in hospital himself more often. In the days when he wasn't that big, compared to the guys now who are, who are like barn doors and, and super fit and very strong, almost like a special breed of uh, from from some kind of factory. But mm. um, he was luckily very fit, even though he's quite slim. But even then, it, it just knocked him for six. And he's uh, taking, taking a while to, to recover. Um, so thinking back to that time when you were 13, and only a few years later, maybe when you were 16 to 18, is quite a seminal stage. I mean, when you were 13 was, was probably the most significant stage of your life. But as you were coming into that adolescent stage of going to do your A-levels and then, and then on to life. What bit of advice now, you know, 20 years later, would you give to that younger Richard Thorpe uh, and go, look, this is what matters and don't worry so much, don't try too hard. I mean, I used to, I was a people pleaser too. I used to try too hard yeah. to, uh, to please my commanding officer or the, um, the mm. senior generals I was working for. And I should actually just relax and got mm -hmm. on with my peers. I looked after my, my troops very well but I was I was too busy trying to please upwards. I think also loss of father, looking for a father figure in in someone more senior, maybe. A psychologist would have a field day with me, Rich. Oh, way yeah. Way more than you, way more than you. But yeah. um, what advice would you give to your younger self, knowing what you know now? So um, I, want, I want to perhaps answering that in two, in two ways, because on the one hand, it might, might address the, the Richard that, is say 13, 14, having, is dealing with the news of his sister. Um, I mean, I read, it was only a few weeks after, I um, can't remember what paper now, but uh, Lawrence Delanio, I don't know if you know this, lost yeah. his sister in a, in a boat accident. Uh, I think it was in, in Italy. When he was yeah. 14, 13 or 14, maybe 15. Yeah. Similar age to me. I was the same position at the time. And Lawrence Delalio was one of my heroes. And I just found that out, obviously, the news of my sister. And we came across this article. And I just, suddenly, I just saw myself in, in Lawrence Delalio. And I thought, God, I mean, how does he conduct himself? He went through the same thing. 
um, uh, how how should I behave now? And he was obviously very always wore a mask, but wore a mask. Guess that he might have worn a, worn a mask to his actual emotions. But he was a bit bruising kind of guy, right? And still is on the on the telly. That's how I thought I should behave. Bottle everything up, deal with it, channel it out on the rugby pitch. I mean, it that experience certainly made me a far more aggressive rugby player, which was useful, I think, going through those sort of county in England age group uh, things. But I, I, had to pay a, I had to pay a price for it later on in my late teens and early 20s with mental health and having, having not dealt with the bereavement correctly. Mm -hmm. um, I, 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 did, I, suffered, I suffered with um, uh, episodes of depression and so on. Yeah. And had to unpick what had, what had gone on. Yeah. So my, my advice now to 13-year-old Richard, and I mean, probably what I, I, I tell myself now whenever tragedies happen, right? That, that happens to us all, sadly. Uh, stuff will, crap will hit the floor, <laughs> will hit the fan and, 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 and go, and, and go uh, off piste for you in life. Mm. Um, allow yourself to feel it. Yeah. Allow yourself the time to emotionally work through the process. Cry, I know when we're men, cry your eyes out if you need to. It's, mm. it's, it's a, it is a, a healthy part of the, uh, of the bereavement process or, or any, any sort of really taxing emotional yeah. time that you're having. Um, go and feel it. And, and I, I, I wonder whether I could have got more out of myself in my late teens, my early twenties, um, had I done that. Yeah, yeah. Because I would have had more resource. I wouldn't have had the months of depression and yeah. so on. And I, yeah. I, there's a part of me that almost could look at that and think, well, it's, it's lost time because of, I didn't know any different. But. Yeah, but it, it makes you the person you are today, all the tough times and the, and the uh, lessons from them. I'm a great follower of the Stoic philosophy and the Daily Stoic is a, a favorite of mine. Every morning, it's the first thing I wake up at 7.30. I'm dyslexic, so my, I, I listen to audiobooks about 160 a year. I get through massive amounts of books on neuroscience and leadership and health and well-being. And that is, is a great solace to me um, with any difficulty that I'm going through. And I also have, have had some mental health challenges and being depressed and feeling quite suicidal at times. And, and, and I find this combination of stoic philosophy, mindfulness, yoga, uh, hit training, you know, fitness train, the gym, walking the mm -hmm. dog, Archie, wherever he is, he's having a sleep over there, crashed out on the sofa behind us. You can really see him. Uh, he's the, we chose him because he's the right color to go with the furniture in my study. Um, no, no, I'm I am joking. Um, but look, thank you for that. Um, let's just go around the inspiring leadership compass. Yeah. Um, there's the eight, the eight components and just very sort of quick fire kind of uh, tips, bits of advice, thoughts you have. Um, MQ is the top, the, the moral component, the integrity, the values. What, what have been your top three foundational values that you, that you were brought up with, that you've lived by? And how did you, if one of them, if you let one slip, how did you quickly get yourself back on track again and back to true north? You know what? I, I, I have a new relationship with values now. Um, being a professional rugby player, any pro rugby players watching this will know all about the value session that you have, probably even anyone in, a, in part of a company, where you kind of just zone out a little bit. It's always the same words that, that go up on the wall. And um, I mean, now as a director of rugby, I, I mean, I, I, I uh, empower my captain to run that session. You know, let's make this player centered. It's your values, not mine, your values. Um, so I've, I, I've changed since becoming a leader as opposed to a, a player um, in rugby uh, and other areas of my life. I, I've refound I've refound values, and uh, number one would be authenticity. It's it is a bit cliche. I think probably all of mine will be, but it's probably cliche for a reason, right? The the stronger you can keep yourself grounded in who you really are be as genuine to your own beliefs as, as you possibly can in as, as many areas of your life as you can, you, you're gonna end up doing well because you will make mistakes along the way and that allows you to perhaps refine 
tune what it is that you're doing. But you have to be being authentic, in my view, to be able to do that. If you're being inauthentic, well, you don't know what to tune. <laughs> you don't know what to refine and, and so on. So authenticity would be, would be number one. Going almost hand in hand with that is honesty. Um, at times I've said ruthless honesty. Uh, I don't say that anymore. I say, I say honesty. Um, <clears throat> uh, I, I think the more hard-nosed rugby, rugby coach that I was a few years ago was a bit more influenced perhaps by my time at Leicester Tigers. Grab the guy by the scruff of the neck and throw him up against a wall when you've got to tell him something approach which would be the Leicester Tigers or certainly the old Leicester Tigers approach yeah it was and I, 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 I do not feel that that is the way to get the best out of a team no. um, I, I think there will be a small minority of players that that works very well with but the majority isn't uh, so anyway I ruthless honesty isn't there it's now honesty and and allowing yourself as well obviously um, what you say day to day is always the truth and so on, but also having the hard conversations. Um, every rugby player that's played at the highest level will know the feeling of a coach not being honest with them. Why have I been dropped? Is rotation. Uh, you'll get him again next week. Or the whole host that I've heard, I've even said a few times earlier on in my coaching career for uh, ever forbid. Players want honesty. They want to be told, you're not good enough. Here's why. And here's what you need to do to go and get better. That's what a player wants to hear. He's not going to like it in the moment, but that is what he wants. And he'll respect you for telling him it. Mm. Uh, but make it conversation-based. Make it dialogue-based. Um, if you've got to deliver bad news, don't, don't hit him with a freight train with it. Um, my, my view, I know plenty of people would, would take that option. But my view is... Um, is make it conversation based, allow them to contribute to the conversation around it, um, perhaps even decide upon it together. If I've got to deliver a bad piece of news and I'm gonna be honest about it, perhaps I might engage in a bit of narrative which might lead the player to tell me that he shouldn't be picked <laughs> if you can frame it in the right way. And it's a decision that you go to together and you both can get a lot more out of it. So honesty. Yep, and the third one? So the third one, you don't need a third, but if you had a third. Well, you see, I was going to, so I was going to say play, being player centered. Again, this is with my DOR hat on, but even, even running, running businesses, um, being, being person centered. So what, what that means to me is I'm not being self centered. I'm not being selfish. Um, yes, yes. What, what I'm getting out of any relationship is very important. Um, but the, in, in my experiences, if you can be truly, truly person centered of the person sat, sat opposite you, you're going to get more out of them and, and they'll, they'll go and deliver more for you, particularly as a leader. Um, so, um, so person centered, if that makes sense. Yeah, that makes complete sense. Thank you. The second one round is PQ, meaning and purpose. Uh, you know, your Dharma, your life calling. What, what, uh, in a sentence gives your life meaning and purpose? Get the best out of people. Yeah. Like, I mean, that's what I do. That's my job. I'm a performance coach. I get the best out of people. And I, I love the, uh, I, I love trying to work it out. I was having this conversation with one of my coaches here at Chinna the other day. He came to me about a player whom, for whatever reason, they just don't, they don't see eye to eye. They butt heads. And, um, and it was triggering things in my coach like he's not good enough and, and so on. Um, shouldn't be there or he's stupid or he doesn't know as much as the player does. And those are the things that were going on for the coach. So his behavior was very much like, right, I'm gonna come back at you. And I just asked him, what's your job? To my coach, what's your job? So well, I'm a, I'm a coach, right. So tell me more, what, what does that mean? I've, I've got to coach these guys to be the best, right. So what is your job in that moment? You've got to get the best out of that guy. He doesn't see, he doesn't see eye to eye with you. Uh, you, might, you might be butting heads. You're never going to please everybody as a leader. You're always, I look at a 50, 50 men in my team meeting room. 
I know full well there's probably 10, maybe 15% that I don't really get, I don't really get through to for whatever reason, because you can't, if you're pleasing everybody, you're letting yourself down, right? And you've got to stand up for who you are and you, you can't make everybody happy. Yeah, um, good advice, good advice. So, um, so yeah, so that was, yeah, that was that. No, that's what, it's good, yeah. I like it. It's a very good, get the best out of people. You're a performance yeah, coach, get, I love get it. Get the best out of people, and, but it's easy to forget. And it's easy yeah. to let your own stuff come up. Oh yeah, and, and this is where, the old classic from 1912 by Dale Carnegie, How to Win Friends and Influence People. I've lit, my mother gave it me a book when I was 20 and I've listened to it again now, uh, almost 40 years later and I go, I missed half the wisdom in that. Yeah. And, and it is great wisdom for us all, don't you think? 100%, a, a real favorite of mine in there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. there's so many that have, have come from that. Um, health quotient is the third one of the eight. Um, it's obviously a key part of your life and your training and, but, but many leadership models in business don't really bring in mental and physical health. We see it as crucial. You clearly do. Um, now as your, uh, you know, running teams, how do you, what few things do you highlight about physical and mental health and the way they meld together? Uh, it, it, as it pertains to my, my people or to myself? Yourself and then your people. Yeah. Okay. Um, oh, I mean, very, very simply for me. I mean, I, I learned this being a player. Um, the, 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 the fitter I was, the, the, the tighter my standards were, um, the better I performed across the board in every area of my life. Uh, I mean, easy to say I was a pro rugby player. So if you're really, really fit, you're going to be a better rugby player, right? But it really did impact every other area of my life as well. When I felt confident in my physical conditioning and in control of my nutrition and my diet and so on, um, without going too far, I think of perhaps a lot of like the, the influences around, um, who I say on social media, around, uh, around personal training and so on, may, may just take it a bit too far. You do need balance in your life. Um, you do need to allow yourself to have that that cold beer at the end of a long, hard day, occasionally, or whatever your thing might be, um, uh, you know, a huge cake on a Sunday or something. Um, but, uh, but yeah, when, you, when, you're, when you're able to maintain your discipline, and I mean, I ebb and flow. I, I don't know if you do um, with your training and your diet, um, but I, I, I tend to. Um, I'll go through periods where if I'm running regularly, it's easy to go for a run. You almost look forward to it. If for whatever reason you didn't get to a run for a whole week, because maybe your nose was in the in the books or whatever it might be, it's so hard to pull yourself to the next to, to go out and do it again. Yeah, and it's an interesting thing you say, Richard, because of the pandemic. And yeah, a year ago I was in a bad place because business was hit very hard. It's it's you know still tough, mm. but I because I've been in a routine. I haven't been traveling around the world or to London a lot. I'm here in Lincolnshire with my wife and our dog that I, I, you can't go anywhere else. So I've actually gone back to my military days as an army officer and got a really good routine, what I call rituals and morning bookends and evening bookends and good sleep in between. And that has so helped me pull myself out of that mm. mental health depression. Mm. Um, and it made me realize I do like routine. Okay. I'm approaching 60, but I'm actually the, the routine of, um, Daily stoic uh, training. Yeah, I'm almost 16 a, a year. So I've just been 59. So um, what's your what's your moisturising regime? <laughs> so yeah, it's a younger wife. She keeps me. She keeps me healthy and good lighting. Good lighting. Um, that's very kind of. You. But um, in all the seriousness, so so when I do daily stoic, then I do 20 minutes of uh, Headspace, a, a 365 day program, which I'm doing every day. Then I do uh, 30 minutes of of yoga or I do 30 minutes of HIIT training in my garage, which I've turned into a gym, uh, Tabata style uh, with different sets of weights and things, but I'm very self-disciplined. Uh, whereas my wife likes to have a personal trainer three times a week and he just be so, and he's a, uh, an ex uh, uh, professional Tottenham football player who's just uh, a super fit and very nice guy to train. So I find, having a discipline, I, I will not give up on that now. 
Whereas before, when I was, my routine was all over the place, it's very hard to keep anything going. But when you're stuck in a lockdown, the only plus side, I think, is that it's allowed me to have that routine. I, I don't know what your feeling has been when you've been in the lockdown and, and doing a routine. Yeah, so I've, um, uh, yeah, a bit of a military background for you, perhaps with the, 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 the routines, because I mean, when I follow a routine, when I'm consistent with what I'm doing, it's, a, it's the same impact as being physically conditioned, fit and everything else that usually go hand in hand. Um, I'm getting more out of myself. Um, I mean, I look at the, at the moment, so I've got a, uh, we've got a two week old baby. Oh, congratulations. Thank you very much. And uh, God, what, what a thing to kill your routine. Yep. <laughs> when, you're getting, when you're getting up at 4 a.m. and he, he, you can't get him back to sleep and then you just continue into the day. Um, it's, um, you think well to stay awake now. Uh, I'm impressed. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to take the lads training in, the, in, in a few hours' time as well. So it's going to be good fun. Uh, nothing like a challenge, right? Yep, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, so I, I find that I've, I, I know what routine works well for me. Uh, when I get to bed early, when I rise early, when I, um, I, I eat a, a, a good breakfast, but I've, I've done some cardiovascular activity beforehand. Mm. Um, and start to structure in the rest of my day with my meetings and, and, and so on and never go, never doing too much in one day, but always making sure I've done enough in order yeah. to sustain yourself over the, over the days. But I, I, I do, I am guilty of, a, of allowing things to come in and knock me off course. Yeah. That's, that, that's what I, where I, I have to really put some attention to and some, some work to pull yeah. myself back into it. Yeah, no, that's, that's really, well, we could talk a, a great length about that. Uh, oh, yeah. my, my wife and I, for the last 30 days, have been doing daily intermittent fasting. So 16 right. hours of fasting, eight hours of eating. And it's really worked well, really, really well um, with um, ketosis and autophagy um, as a good byproduct. But that's another story. Yeah. Uh, we were talking earlier, you and I, before the program about uh, CQ, cultural intelligence question, that yeah. ability to respect diversity, equality of everybody and inclusion. And how have you adapted to situations which are culturally different from what you've had? And if you were to give a tip to people listening, other leaders, about having good cultural um, intelligence question, what would you say? So, I mean, I've, I, I've stepped into a, into a rugby club. I've only been in this role for under 12 months. And I, I stepped into a very different culture uh, to perhaps what it is, what I like to think it is now. Um, and it's very hard to step in and change a culture in my, in my fairly limited experience doing it, but I've been on the other side of it a number of times now with new directors coming in and taking over a rugby club and I'm a player. And you can hear a new DOR, director of rugby, uh, walk in for his first day and address the front of the, from the front of the room and you look at him and you go, mate, this is not gonna work, pal. <laughs> um, you're really going to come unstuck trying to do this. Looking around at some of the other senior players in the room and everyone's just shaking their head. He didn't know his players yet. He, he, and you, uh, so what my, what I've tried to learn from my experiences as a player, what captured me? What was it? What was it about those, those managers or those deep directors that when they walk in, you, you, suddenly your eyes get a bit brighter and you, you sit on the edge of your seat. You're, like, you're looking forward to what they're going to say. Mm. Well, first, they've got to be good orators, um, but they, they need to capture you. And everybody's different, like we were saying earlier. You're, yeah, okay, you can go catch all and have, you're, you're wide, not very deep with, your, with what you're going for. Or perhaps you might single out some of your senior leaders and get them on side. Um, so I put a lot of groundwork in one-to-one -one with, um, with senior players, coaches. Um, I recruited people that I knew I would work well with and would share my vision yeah. um, and deliver on it, ultimately. Uh, so I, I had to do some recruitment there. Yeah, that's spot on. No, I, I think it's a fascinating area, sort of cult cultural yeah. intelligence, getting the culture. The, the, the leader does set the tone from the top. If he's a CEO, he sets the tone or she sets the tone. 
Um, and if you're the, the director of rugby, you set the tone. I, I think it's a very interesting one. And changing a toxic culture into a high performing one, that's a real skill. And that's worth a lot if, if a, a CEO or a managing director or partner can do that. Mm. Moving on from that to another bit, but a, perhaps a smaller individual component is emotional and social intelligence. Reading and managing your own emotions, reading and managing others' emotions, and then reading the reality of the situation, what's going on in the club, in the business, in the, mm. in the, in the mm. profession of rugby or in the business mm. you're in. Mm. If you were to pick out a couple of skills around rapport building and listening and relating to people, you know, here you are a high performance coach, what, what, would you, what would be a couple of top tips you'd give around developing emotional? Because you can develop it. Some people don't have much of it and they, it's like running into a freight train when you meet them. But others, uh, they can, if they're up for it, if they want to, they can develop it like a language skill. What, what's your experience? Oh, I mean, yeah, they, they absolutely can. Um, be curious about people. Mm, mm. Just having, a, having just an open mindset and a curiosity about, about other people. Why are they saying what they're saying? Why, why might they behaving, be behaving the way that they're behaving? Just because something, someone says something to you doesn't mean that that's what re they really mean. Um, I mean, okay, so perhaps if I address myself, um, I've, quite, I've done a lot of work recently around um, working on like what, what some authors have called mind traps, but what the psychologists call schemas. All right, yep. Yeah. So a schema, an early maladaptive schema, is it's part of your neurological development, right? When you're when you by the time you're five, your brain's ninety percent developed. Neurogenesis is happening within your yep. within the neurons and, and everything else. But the, the your, your natural temperament and your experiences as a child, if you're not getting your core needs met, and this can happen to anyone. I mean, entitlement is a key schema, right? So you think, oh, I've given my kid everything that I could possibly have done. You've gone too far with it. And actually one of their needs for, for say uh, autonomy or spontaneity or something hasn't been met. And they might develop what psychologists call a, an early maladaptive schema. So I've got an interest and a bit of a student of it at, at the moment. And doing, doing some work on myself, realized that I've got a failure schema I've got this natural predisposition in my self-talk. This is what goes on in my own mind um, to say things to myself like, I'm probably not good enough for this. Uh, I'm pro you're probably going to screw this up. Um, every and here's the, here was the big one for me. Nobody thinks you can do this. Everyone thinks that you're, you're, you're a fraud, that imposter syndrome. Um, mm. I've, I've, stood at, I've, I've caught myself recently the front of the room thinking everyone knows you're a fraud rich what are you doing this is my own self-talk which i know is an early maladaptive schema mm -hmm. or around failure um taking the driving seat so what do you do about that uh, you've got to quieten it down you've got to recognize it for what it is and say yeah see you later mate I i'm gonna go with some evidence that I've found over here where I've smashed it as a coach. I'm going to focus on that. This is the, this is my own internal dialogue. I hope I don't seem crazy. Um, yeah. um, and you, you change your thinking, mm -hmm. you change the, mm -hmm. the thought and yeah. it allows you to let go of that negative, negative, uh, yeah. Autom it, autom it, automatic negative thought. It's a very interesting area you talked about. I, I spent some fascinating time, <laughs> with two head cases, Bandler and McKenna, uh, in their neurolinguistic programming. One was a, oh. had been a hellraiser and a biker, and the other one was the, the hypnotist on stage. But on this seven-day neurolinguistic programming course, you could see them take people's beliefs, rewind them, churn them around, break them up, and so that they weren't they weren't hung right up there. by them. It yeah. was it was same, really same stuff. Yeah, it, it, some of it's some of it's shamanism and just magic and you know dust and and a lot of rubbish. But if if it gets abused by a salesman trying to sort of t play with your mind to buy something, but if it's used healthily, I, I love the the simplest of them all, which is 
uh, as your as your is it a daughter? Your two year old, two week old, son, son. As your son grows up, he might say to you, "Daddy, I, I can't do that." Now that's ah, an untrue, untrue limiting, untrue exactly. limiting assumption lived as if it's true. So yeah. the lovely replay of a different positive alternative. And son, if you could do it, how would you do it? And he goes, "I'd do it this way, Daddy." And you go, "Good lad, good on you." So so you're getting them to to work their own through, and and it often. We, we have these limiting assumptions yeah. and it's great to check them. Is it logical? Do you have any uh, information to say you can't do this? Yeah. Uh, and is it a positive view of human psychology? Fascinating area. I, to, with, just, just quickly on that, I use this all the time because I'll ask players to do something uh, or do they know something? And they'll say, I don't know. So I'll say, very similar. Well, if you did know, what would you say? It's and, very true. It and they've got access, got access to different part of your brain right yeah it goes like a mouse it goes running through the maze looking for it, it it's, a, it's, it's amazing it goes and so they come out with the answer yeah, <laughs> yeah. well there you go. wow <laughs> no it's it's a treat and and this is why uh in, in your ongoing development have a look at my website jonathanperks.com I've oh, got a number, I number of book reviews on there yeah. uh, and my the top one we just talked about the second one is the the promise by nancy klein that changed everything i won't interrupt you but in there, she talks about, and she's helped me a lot with untrue limiting assumptions that we live as if true and a positive in alternative assumption or an incisive question. If you knew you couldn't fail, how would you go about it? I'd do this, this, and this. And what else would you do? I'd do this, this, and this. And it's just so liberating. Yeah. Um, last few questions, uh, Rich. Um, resilience, uh, you know, crikey. Setbacks, disappointments, uh, whether it be with your players, whatever. If you gave one tip on resilience against adversity, picking yourself up when you've not, what's your resilience tip? Well, so I, I always start this sort of question just reminding us all what resilience is, right? I mean, you've 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 done it for us already, Jonathan. Um, but it's it's picking yourself back up when you fail, right? And your ability to with to withstand um, challenges and so on. What I've learned from my experience, pretty much the only way you can develop experience is by failing. Oh, okay, you might be able to find a few other ways, but you've got to go out there and fall down and learn how to pick yourself back up. Same as a baby learning to walk, right? Um, I, I, I see failure and resilience sort of sitting hand in hand. And uh, whilst someone might listen to that and think, well, yeah, I was about to say, good for you. You've had a lot of failures, which is true. <laughs> but, and so you could be resilient. But, I, but I'm not resilient. Um, well, perhaps you might want to address your relationship with failure. Mm. What does failure mean to you? Many people, my clients, would turn around and say, it means I'm not good enough. I would say, well, hang on a minute. Are you doing something that is outside of your comfort zone, that, you've, that you're not confident in? Oh, yeah. Right. Well, failure goes with the territory, my friend. <laughs> if you're going to push your boundaries and start doing things that you've never done before and reaching with yourself, you're going to open yourself up to failure and rejection and um, being let down and, and so on. That's where, that's where the, that's the realm where these things lie, right? Uh, that's beautifully put. And in fact, let me build on that. And, and one of the things in the conversation with Nancy, she said, if you have a Y axis and an X axis and the X axis is your abilities and the Y axis is the challenges, but your opportunities, but maybe the challenges you face. If you draw a 45 degree line on that line, all the way up that line, your challenges are met by your ability. You can do it all. Below that line, you're, you're not stretched. You're just not being stretched at all. Above the line, that's the place of not knowing, failure, uncertainty. Uh, yeah. They'll find me out, um, fraud, I, you know, oh my God, imposter syndrome. Yeah. However, above the 45 is where all the growth happens. So, so, so yeah. she says, live yeah. above the 45, live above the 40. So if that's a tip that she gave me, please use it yourself. Live above oh, the 45. Oh, yeah. but please, can I, can I steal it? Yeah. Yeah, do it. It's but, yeah, brilliant. So have, having changed my relationship with failure, let's not forget failure is one of my early maladaptive schemas. It's something that I've really struggled with over my life, but I've got such a different relationship with it now. Yeah. I mean, I look at myself tonight. So I've got a two, two week old baby. I've barely slept. I've got uh, new players turning up. We're going to have 30, 
35, 37 players out there. I've got to run the show. I'm knackered. haven't really eaten well. I've thrown all of my energy into the uh, Inspiring Leadership podcast so that I'm now yeah. riding, on, riding on empty. Only joke. Only joking. So let's try and save a bit. Um, so my view there now is, God, I wonder if I can still do it. Yeah, it's going to be tough, but I wonder who I could be if I get through this and what I'm going to learn about myself. That Those are the looking again at that self-talk, the negative ones of the automatic, they, they come in easy. They're always there, right? They're driven by that, um, that, that sort of uh, ancestral, ancestral part of our brain, the limbic yeah. brain or whatever you, you know your neuroscience more than me. Um, but we can choose to whether we listen to them or not. And we allow the new thought that we've conditioned ourselves to have to come in and take centre stage. So I, I now start thinking, do you know what? I am knackered. I don't, I, I'm not really prepared. I don't even really know what I'm going to do. Let's go and see what happens. Yeah, let's go. Bang, and let's go get to work. Yeah. And as, if, you, if you've got a positive, open attitude, the players will respond to you. People Correct. People will respond to you. And, and, that, and that leads us nicely onto the penultimate one, which is brand, reputation, yeah. image, and impact. Because you've got a brand and a reputation for getting things done, of helping people perform. If you were to give a tip about helping people improve their reputation with others and their image and their impact, what would it be? Um, so to, to, to help improve what other people think of you? Yeah. Um, so I think now about... about um, what my players think of me and I model behavior um, they're my, they are my I know we do the player centered stuff but really it's it's my personality that drives the squad like any leader it's your personality that really drives it and if you if you get if you let it stretch too far away from you you don't know who you are anymore and your culture might suffer um, so there is a bit of a yin and yang, I think, there with being player sent or person centered and then be and putting your own stamp on the identity of your team, right? Um, so I, I think it would have to be you've got to acknowledge that you model behavior. Yeah. Your team look to you with how to behave. Yeah. If they yeah. see you dropping litter litter on the floor, you have immediately said it's okay. If and that, and that's, no, but that's, that's brilliant. And, and that's where, it, as army officer at Santos, where I was an instructor, it, that the motto was serve to lead. Officers, so, eat, oh, officers, eat, officers eat last, yeah. servant leadership. Yeah. Uh, and so this is where people watch the reality. They don't listen to the rhetoric. They're learning you. Your players are learning how you turn up and behave. Yeah. Time is slightly short. So I just want to catch it. I don't want to let you go without a couple of the other ones, which are great. Legacy, and then we're going to talk about teams, toxic teams into high-performing teams, then a book, uh, and then your top tips. So, so briefly, what, what would you like your legacy to be? In, so I, I, I thought this one a few years ago. Um, it was when I was in still the property business. Um, but it was to, to like leave the world in a better place than, than what it was when you came into it. Mm. it. Sounds a huge undertaking that obviously you're not really going to, but in your own little way, let it be a, let it be a, a, a notch up. Mm. Just have, have made a, a positive improvement. I know that's so general and not very yeah, specific. It's, it's love. I love it. Um, it's about stewardship, even of your team. You want to leave the team better than you found it. And, and, and whether you're a CEO going into yeah, business, you want to leave the business better than you found it. And, and for you and I as performance coaches, you're helping people think about themselves better and raise their game. Yeah. So if, from that to teams, because it's a similar thing, how have you, if, if there's one bit of advice about taking a toxic team mm. and making it more high performing, what mm. do you have to do to get rid of the toxicity? Uh, have you seen practically? You've got to align people on purpose and vision. Um, toxicity, like when people are starting to look inwards uh, or they don't, there's poisonous language being used in the changing rooms. 
um, use the business environment, run a coffee machine or whatever it is. Um, my argument would be that those, those people that are being poisonous or those people that are being toxic, to use your words, aren't aligned on your vision and your purpose. You, you haven't captured them. And I don't blame the players in this scenario. Like the example I gave earlier about my coach not being able to get through to one of their players, I don't view that as the player's fault. Mm. It's the coach's responsibility to work out how to get through to that player, yeah. um, in my view. Yeah, that's good. Um, because the player's the talent. I've got him here to, to perform, right? Um, yeah, okay, I might churn him out in recruitment once a year. Um, yeah. But it's the same with it's the same with um, with the rest of the squad. Good, good. So um, before we do the top tip, uh, what would be your favourite book, and why would you recommend that one? Oh, um, I might be like I I read I read a, a good fair chunk. Um, I mean to yeah to sort of look all the way through it. The, okay, so this is the one I told you about this before. Uh, David David Goggins uh, can't hurt me. Um, really enjoyed that that book, yeah. um, and uh, and my, I just found it inspirational. Like the doing the hard things every day without fail. Yeah. It's gonna hurt. Doesn't matter. Get up and do it. But uh, it's worth reading because. I mean, I certainly found it inspiring to go out and wake up at 4 a.m. And, and, and go and run 30 miles. <laughs> I always wanted, I never did it, but, <laughs> but I wanted to do it. Yeah, no, uh, he, he is a, he, the man is a, a machine, just, just oh, phenomenal. Yeah. And, and I, I loved listening to his yeah. audio book. We'd love to have him on the podcast at one stage. So when you, when you meet him, let him know. Um, but um, so let's let's now go for the uh, your your final top tip. If you just introduce yourself and and share the top tip, that'd be great. And then when we finished, stay on the line. We'll have a bit of a chat at the end of recording. But what's what's your top tip, Rich? So I'm Richard Thorpe uh, with the Inspiring Leadership Podcast uh, with Jonathan Bauman Perks. And my top tip: if you're going to be an outstanding leader or performer in any area of your life, get comfortable with failure. Failure goes hand in hand with high level performance. Once you can get a grip on failure, well now you can really open up your potential. That's fantastic. Hey Richard, thank you very much indeed. It's great having you on the series. You are an inspiration and I look forward to staying in touch because I really resonate with what you stand for. So thank you. Absolutely, look forward to it. Thanks Jonathan. Bye. <laughs>